Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. My name is Chris Ward. I'm a part of the leadership team here at HyperFi. While people gather, we're gonna wait for about 30 seconds and then we'll get started. Just give us a moment. Okay, once again, uh, thank you very much for taking time out of your day to be with us. My name is Chris Ward, part of the leadership team here at Hyperfine, and uh, thank you again for your interest in our company. Um, today, what we're going to do is a few things. Uh, we're going to look at a few slides, not spend too much time in PowerPoint. We're going to show you a product demo. Um, what does it look like to drive your MRI device, which is a really fun statement, but we'll show you how to drive it into our simulated ICU here in Connecticut about two hours outside of New York City. We'll show you how to load our patient volunteer. We'll initiate scans using our included iPad interface. And then we'll review uh, images, both the images we captured today, as well as clinical images coming from our uh, field of users. Um, as we go, I'll introduce you to several of my peers here at Hyperfine. Uh, let's get started. Next slide, please. A little about Hyperfine. So Hyperfine was founded in 2014 by Jonathan Rothberg. And Jonathan's view, as you can see here, is really about ubiquitous access, driving broader access, breaking down barriers to the use of imaging devices and other technologies. Jonathan is also the founder of Butterfly Network. You probably know in point of care, ultrasound uh, world, about a $2,000 you know, plug into your iPhone device. And really in 2014, when the company was founded, there were two core goals. One was, we want to go bedside, bring MR imaging to the patient bedside. The second one is about economic accessibility. And if you did those two things, you would unlock that democratization, that, that, that frictionless access to MR imaging. Next slide. Now, as I think about my life and I look at photography in the life of myself and my my family and I look at that and I look around at my friends and my, my brother and my sister and I, I kind of look at it and I say, look, the photographs that we have in my household are, are different and more and even better than what I had as a child growing up. I'm gonna to turn to Brian Welch, our head of clinical science here and ask him that question. So Brian, uh, off camera here, but Brian, when you think about yourself and your photography around your family and your kids, are you a better photographer than your parents and why? Well, I've got a camera with me all the time. I've got my smartphone, so I take a lot more pictures, that's for sure. I think that's about it. So when you think about that idea of we all have a camera in our pockets, and because of that, we have more at-bats. We're able to easier get those photographs of those small life moments. We don't have to go to the closet, pull out the SLR, connect the lens, check the memory chip, or check the film, and do those things. And that was the experience, of course, of most of our parents. Next slide, please. So here it is on, on a single page is our device, save for two things. Let me orient you first to what you're looking at. Start from the bottom and go to the top. Bottom are wheels. So imagine like a wheelchair, powered wheelchair, drive wheels underneath, casters on the outside for stability. Just above that, where you see the vertical slats is our onboard uh, workstation. And then you get to the kind of the working end of our device. You're looking into an eight channel head coil surrounded by an aluminum cage to control for the RF uh, and signal that we want inside and the RF signal and the electromagnetic interference that we don't want, giving us a clean environment. You know, we're mobile, we roll around, a clean environment in which to work. At the top, we have something around, you see a neon yellow called a Gauss guard. It's a protective device. We'll show that to you in a moment. I mentioned two things missing. One, it kind of peaks out there, a power cord. We plug into a standard wall outlet. We use about 900 watts of power, which is in the world of a coffee pot is about what we use. So a remarkably electrically efficient machine. If you want to go bedside, you can't have fancy power requirements. The second thing not pictured, iPad. That's our interface. If you can use an iPad, you can choose a Spotify playlist and order your music similar to how we do it with our uh, different sequences. Next slide. 
an image here that uh, gets me in the throat every time I look at it. When we think about the challenge, and, and perhaps we've been there either on the clinical side or on the family side, and you think about what people go through, everybody has an MR story. Uh, well, not everybody, but a lot of people have an MR story. And the idea of being able to maintain physical contact, remain in physical contact with somebody, to remain in voice contact or even eye contact, as you can see in this photo, during the exam. It's a wild moment in MR history, if ever there was one. Also, if you look at this photo, you'll see, look carefully at mom, you'll see wedding jewelry on her left arm and tucked up against her sleeve, there's actually a Fitbit right there. We'll talk about our field strength. And again, uh, the projectile events that we normally associate with MR imaging. We'll talk about how we manage for that too. Next slide. Our workflow in a single page. You're gonna see this here live today, but the idea that this five feet tall, three feet wide device wheels right to bedside, very simply. You'll notice the left hand here of our driver on the joystick. It is a powered device. You plug it into wall power to operate the scan, but of course it drives around on battery power. Next slide. You were curious about that curious neon yellow thing I mentioned. This is our five Gauss line. So just marking to the, the world, to the community, to passersby, hey, we got a permanent magnet kind of wheeling by you. You may have a neural stim or you may have a pacing uh, device. Let's just be cautious around that. 62 inches across is what you're looking at is our five Gauss line. Next slide. If we were together, we'd see these things up close in person, but I'll kind of zoom in here through the benefit of uh, some photography. Lower left, you see for the first time where the iPad, where we operate, right there, right next to the magnet. That's outside of the five Gauss line. So we're in great shape, but we're not looking at a device that gets wiped clean or gets pulled into the magnet or anything like that. On the right side, notice the clean surfaces. So you have the two magnetic poles, top and bottom. You got the eight channel head coil. And when you think about a world in which we're all daily, hourly, minute by minute conscious about infection control, the ability to wipe all of this out, go bedside, perhaps into a COVID positive patient, you know, room and clean it out real quickly, move on to the next patient. Very different than conventional MR. Next slide. By now, as you think about the idea of portable MR imaging, drive your MRI. As you think about that, you're probably cycling through different use cases. And you're realizing that as the iPhone in our pocket helps to give us more opportunities to be a better photographer, so you think about that, you realize the other use cases. Certainly you can think about the emergency department. You can think about ICUs and avoiding hours long patient transport, you know, round trip, four hours, whatever it may be, serial monitoring. You'd love to know in the acute or subacute phase, what's going on. And if it was easier to access MR imaging, you'd have better information upon which to make clinical decisions. You work down your list, you think about rural care, you think about other opportunities, think about senior care, and you keep on going. The photos here come from Yale, a great partner of ours, about 20 to 30 minutes away from our door here. And you can almost, you can almost, you know, barely detect our system in that environment. That's an MR suite in hyperfine terms, really anywhere. So controlling for the electromagnetic interference in the environment, low field strength so that we don't create projectile events, this is where we go to work. Next slide. Zooming in again a little bit on an MR suite as we, uh, we, we talk about it, but you're looking here, a uh, COVID positive intubated patient. And again, next to the drips, the vents, the HVAC equipment, the patient monitor, whatever it may be, this is the environment. I'll also point out that uh, the young resident here in the photo who, uh, who generated the scans for us and is in the photograph, you know, we train people in about 30 minutes how to use our system. And it is one of the most noteworthy training sessions you'll ever attend because it's got a joystick, which we use to control our device. So we're gonna spend 15 minutes teaching you how to drive your MR device down the hall and into the room and into the head of the bed, which we're gonna show you. And then you're gonna spend the other half of that time with an iPad, again, back to your playlist kind of feel, T1, T2, 
DWI, which one am I ordering in what sequence? Uh, that consists of our training, about 30 minutes of training per user. Next slide. And then I, I would bet that most of us know the day when a new MR system is swapped out in your hospital or when it's added to the radiology department because you see the trucks, the crane, the jackhammer, there, there's a cement truck, there's a lot involved, it's pretty invasive. When you look at hyperfine in a world like five feet tall, three feet wide, weighs about 1400 pounds, so it's a very lightweight system, we wheel into the front door of hospitals. If we need to go into a loading dock, we can do that too. We fit on a standard patient elevator. And again, we designed ourselves so we fit through a standard doorway. If our mission was to go bedside in the clinical environment, there are established you know, doorways of a certain width. So that set in place a whole bunch of design decisions about how wide our magnet would be, the gap between the two magnetic poles, a bunch of decisions are made once you commit to going bedside. It benefits us on the delivery side where we can be on site, back the truck up, unload, and be back you know, through training and everything inside of hours. It's a new model for MR deployment. Next slide. I'll highlight here a very popular paper that appeared uh, last year, um, lead uh, in, uh, author from Yale, but it appeared in JAMA Neurology. And it makes, you can see the images here, maybe for the first time that we've uh, seen today during our time together, but you'll see a comparison to, in this case, it says SOC, but you're looking at contrast CT here. So a great article about neuro ICU application for swoop portable MR imaging. Next slide. And then images from across our uh, growing number of users. Um, we're only for sale in the United States right now, uh, working quickly to expand to additional countries. But you'll see here a different moment in MR history, a different use case. Um, we have countless stories about time saved. I'll relate one with you real quickly. We deployed to a stroke unit just the other day, and uh, the whole hospital was aware of this newfangled device, this what is portable MR imaging? How is that possible? So there was some, some buzz you know, across the clinical community. And a call came into that stroke unit and said, hey, we've got a patient here in the medical ICU, a positive COVID positive patient. We need to transport that patient down to radiology and back for a scan. That's four hours. Do you mind if we took swoop and brought it up here and, and got an exam done real quick? And indeed, that's what done. That was that, that's what was done. Did that save three hours, two hours? I don't know, but it was a lot of time. Quick example. Uh, next slide, please. We're gonna see all this here in a moment, so I, I won't hover, but on the left side, iPad interface. We talked about kind of the playlist type feel to that. You will see images as we capture our volunteer's brain on the scan. You will see those images appear. Once we have 10% of the data acquired, we're gonna pop the image on the screen. Be a, uh, more than a little fuzzy, but it's going to start giving you clinical information at bedside on the iPad. Every time we acquire 10% more data, the image is going to improve and improve and improve and improve. Next slide. Okay, so with that, we're going to jump into our demo. Uh, Dr. Brian Welch, uh, PhD, is with me here. He spoke earlier, head of clinical science. He's going to narrate us through this after which we'll look at the images we generate from our volunteer, also part of our clinical science team, Dr. Samantha Bai. And then we'll hear from Eddie Knopp, Dr. Eddie Knopp. Um, Eddie is a neuroradiologist, uh, joined Hyperfine uh, at the beginning of this year. And his background is principally at NYU, New York University, but a long career in neuroradiology, over 200 invited lectures around the world. So a true expert to talk about what he's seeing in the images and the application, the clinical use case for SWOOP portable MR. With that, let me go uh, drive the system and we'll get into our demo. Thank you. All right, everyone, we're just getting our camera set up in the hallway. We'll spotlight that video as soon as it's available. So. Here we've got the shot of Chris behind the scanner. And he's just turned the key into the drive mode and he's using the joystick right now to move the scanner down the hallway 
and into the doorway or through the doorway of our mock intensive care unit here at headquarters. He's going to stop here for a moment and give you a close up view of the foldable bridge. This is what spans the gap between the uh, magnet and the, and the patient's bed. He's going to take a metal keychain that's got right there in his right hand. He's going to demonstrate the type of pull that the magnets have. It's very gentle compared to other high field conventional MRI scanners that turn metal objects into projectiles like a bullet. It's not scary in our scanner. He can pull that away with just one or two fingers. It's very gentle. And when it does get pulled, it's pulling it towards the magnets at the top of bottom, not towards the patient's face. So he's going to fold the bridge back up again, finish driving it to the head side of this uh, Hill-Rom patient hospital bed that we have here at headquarters. We have our patient volunteer waiting for her scan. So Chris is uh, parking it slowly up there. He just had to get it close enough to pull the bridge down and cover that gap, which he's doing now. And now he's going to grab the power cord, which is just a standard hospital grade uh, power cord. Uh, with a three prong outlet on one end. It goes into a standard outlet uh, that's 110 volt, uh, 15 amps or less, and um, plugs it in. And today we're going to use the Ethernet connection for convenience, but we can also connect the hospital network uh, with a Wi Fi connection, 2.4 gigahertz or 5 gigahertz. So the scanner is powered on now, and Chris is going to prepare to lift the, uh, the patient. Uh, we're going to have a little help. Um, I'm going to help Chris do this lift. I just want to point out that, that uh, we can uh, open the RF screen on one side. And then it's very easy to access the head coil. This is a pad for comfort of the patient. It also has a little bit of padding inside the, uh, the head coil underneath the head. And this is how they do it in the ICUs in the real world. Do you want to count, Chris? Three, two, one. And we'll just slide right in. Then you make sure that the arm screen is closed. Uh, we can even put a, an e cushion underneath to make the person a little more comfortable. So, what I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to switch over to the user interface that you would normally see on the iPad tablet controller. But I'm going to display it from my laptop computer so that you can see, uh, see it much better across the Zoom. So, uh, I'm going to unspotlight this video screen, spotlight. and now I'm going to share the screen of the scanner's interface. So every operator will have their own unique credentials to log into the scanner. I'm just going to log in with some uh, standard ones that are available. And the first thing you're going to see is the patient tab. This is where you start to enter the information for the scan. You can do this manually if you know all the information or in the hospital where you often have orders already in a modality workless server, you can just pull the order right out of that MWL server. So here in the lab at headquarters, we have uh, an MWL server set up. We've got some, uh, some synthetic orders here. I'll just pick JNQ public. You can see all the details fill up filling in on the right-hand side. When I say register patient, it automatically populates that in. You can further customize uh, the, the indication or the comments. And one interesting feature is that uh, we accept uh, a field of email addresses. You can also set up a group email address uh, that was sent to multiple people. And then everybody that's in the intensive care unit, the emergency department, or whatever part of the hospital the scanner's in, they're very busy and, and they're running around, but they know that the hypervine portable MRI has been ordered. They can get an email sent with a set of anonymized de identified images uh, in an email that have, has no PHI, but they'll get that right away as soon as they get it. Once the patient is set up, you would go to the exam tab and pick a protocol among, from among the preset protocols. We have one for ischemic stroke, uh, for headache, bleed, hydrocephalus, and uh, what these protocols are, different sets and orders of the T1, T2, flare, and diffusion-weighted sequences that are available on the system. So for ischemic stroke, diffusion-weighted imaging and ADC map and apparent diffusion coefficient map is very important. So that comes uh, very early in the order. Uh, but, as, uh, but for something like bleed, DWI is uh, not as important, so instead T2 and flare are early. You can always re decide to rearrange things uh, by just using your finger on the iPad, clicking and dragging. And if you decide you don't want certain sequences, just click the X on the right hand side and delete it away. So I'm going to read all this way. You can also add sequences a la carte. If you want to do a coronal flare at any point, you can add that. Uh, I'm going to pick 
that cheap two weighted sequence again uh, and get that going. Once it's uh, in the order you want, you just have to hit the play button. And it's just like uh, playing a list of songs on uh, your MP3 player and you're ready to go. And once it's started, uh, you'll start to see progress messages along the top bar. Uh, it's doing a few calibration steps. Uh, but at any time, I can go back here and if I decided I wanted to add a sequence, I can do that. So I'm going to be quiet for just a moment and let you hear the sound of the scanner. So that is the sound of a 3D fast spin echo T2 weighted scan. Uh, you can hear the buzzing of the uh, radiance and the uh, RF echo train there. Um, and one thing to point out when we loaded um, our colleague Samantha, she had no ear protection uh, in her ears, no earplugs or anything covering her ears because it's not necessary. The acoustic noise level is much lower than high field conventional MRI. Uh, our loudest sequence is just about 90 decibels, much below the, the threshold necessary for uh, high field protection. So uh, the scan is running, and uh, I'm going to switch over to the scan tab and let you see the first updates uh, coming in. Uh, as Chris mentioned, after about 10% of the data, which this is the first 10%, we already are seeing a full stack of slices, all 36 slices, five millimeters thick. You can tell this is an axial scan of the brain. You can see the shape of the brain there. And this is just going to get sharper and crisper as the data continues to be acquired and get incorporated to this real-time reconstruction. So the usefulness of this is in the emergency setting uh, or even in the ICU setting where uh, there might have been an altered uh, mental state that happened. Uh, if you do one of these scans and you immediately see a large um, unexpected pathology in your bleed or some type of mass effect, you don't even have to finish the scan uh, if you know what's happening. So here we've got uh, two updates uh, that have occurred and now we're starting to see some of the anatomy. Uh, we can see the orbits. Uh, down uh, to the coverage of the lower brain and the cervical spine, or at least the beginning of the cervical spine. And we can start to see the ventricles left and right, and we can see the cell cell gyro. So this is just going to get sharper and crisper as we go. Um, we've got a few more minutes left in the scan. So uh, I'm going to hand it over to Mark and Rob uh, to make some comments. And do you uh, need the screen share, Dr. Knopf? Yes, I'm going to screen share now. Hello, everyone. Before I start showing you some cases, I just want to make an important point, at least from a clinical standpoint. At least in my mind, this system is not there to replace your existing 153 t 7 whatever you happen to have. As Instead, it's there as an adjunct. It's going to su supplement your normal imaging procedures to answer specific clinical questions in clinical scenarios where you couldn't or don't want to transport the patient. You're going to get the, you have unstable patients, you have patients in a COVID unit, you have patients in neurosurgical ICU. You no longer have to pack those patients up and ship them down to the MRI department, but rather have the MR in your ICU and get the answer to your specific clinical questions. So let's take a look at this patient in a COVID ICU where there was a question, it was intubated patient, COVID ICU, there's a question of an infarct. And what we can see already is signal abnormality within the left, uh, almost ICA territory. The diffusion abnormality, we can see here, I'm just gonna minimize that. There's diffusion abnormality and restricted diffusion on the ADC. This patient was then determined to have what they thought was a large vessel occlusion and went to the angio suite for mechanical thrombectomy. We have another example of a patient with posterior fossa dysfunction, also COVID patient, that's just the nature of the beast right now. We see a large area of signal abnormality with mass effect on the fourth ventricle on this T2 weighted image in the vascular distribution of the superior cerebellar artery. Diffusion abnormality is markedly increased signal on the diffusion with restriction on the ADC. There's the diffusion and the ADC image. So she has a fairly large area, posterior circulation infarct. The decision was made to treat her somewhat non-aggressively for fear of increasing mass effect or hemorrhage into that infarct and with potential resultant obstructive hydrocephalus. The last example I can show you is another 
intubated COVID patient during the height of the COVID explosion here in the Northeast where resources were significantly limited. This patient had a known large infarct, was still deteriorating with what appeared to be clinically as best they could tell progression of the infarct. So the question is, is this patient progressing or not? We can see the large MCA territory area of signal abnormality with mass effect. And on the diffusion weighted image, we can see that there are areas that look like they're brighter and increased signal that indeed have restricted diffusion on the ADC. So it was determined from a clinical standpoint that this patient was progressing and a decision was made along with consulting with the family to terminate life support and use those resources for patients that may have a better chance of survival. So I hope you can see from this that we can answer specific clinical questions in a scenario where you wouldn't otherwise necessarily be able to get that question answered in a safe and efficacious fashion. Dr. Rapp, there's a question that's come in uh, on the Q&A panel. Please, anyone that has questions, feel free to enter questions there. The question is, so are there any major pathology that SWOOP cannot detect that would be detected at higher resolution? Okay, so that's an excellent question. And in terms of major pathologies, obviously large intraparenchymal abnormalities you're gonna see. One major pathology, the clinical scenario may be slightly different, and that's the presence of acute subarachnoid hemorrhage. Because of the field strength and the decrease in susceptibility, subarachnoid hemorrhage is not, is not seen on the scanner. However, your first study of choice anyways is gonna be a non-contrast head CT. So we're not kind of eliminating that. Other than that, image size, we can see lesions. And there was a colleague at the University of California, Irvine, who was reporting to me the other day that he was able to see small acute infarcts on the order of seven millimeters. We've seen similar examples of small lesion size in the setting of patients with demyelinating disease, multiple sclerosis, in this case came from University of Pennsylvania, small tiny demyelinating lesions that looked almost identical to what was seen at their high field 3T system. Obviously the 3T had higher resolution, but the lesions were seen to the same conspicuity. Thank you. I'm going to switch back over to the screen share from my laptop so everyone can see the images that have been acquiring in the background while you were showing us those cases right now. So here is uh, a reconstruction using all the data, but it's still not the final, final reconstruction. Um, I'm going to go ahead and auto window and move out fill all that. So you can see uh, much more uh, spatial resolution has been added to the reconstruction because we have all the data now. Um, but you might uh, uh, notice that the uniformity across uh, the field of view is not uh, quite what, uh, what we would be used to. And that's because this final stage of reconstruction is going to account for all of that. Our, our head coil has eight received channels. And in this final stage of reconstruction, it's going to correct for the difference in the sensitivity of each of those channels. And any of the residual uh, noise bands or anything are going to get removed in this final stage of reconstruction. So we have about uh, just a little over a minute, uh, maybe uh, a minute and 40 or five seconds left in this final reconstruction reconstruction stage. If we had other sequences queued up on the exam table uh, uh, tab to run after the T2, they would already be scanning at this very moment. There'd be no dead time waiting for this reconstruction. It would just uh, feed right into that next sequence, but we don't have anything following it right now. So we have a little bit of time to wait before we'll see the final recon. And when that final recon comes through, the bar along the top, because it's the last scan of, of the uh, protocol, will go green. And uh, there'll be a green check mark that once we click that, the DICOMs go across the network, either to the hyperfine cloud packs, uh, or uh, they can simultaneously go to the local hospital packs in the DICOM format. Uh, that's also when the email is triggered to send uh, to anyone who's been listed on that page. So we have just about a minute left. I'm gonna, I see there maybe is a question to ask here. Uh, let me switch over to that window and see what we have here. Okay. Uh, someone has asked, what is the highest resolution with regard to slice thickness and can 3D be done? Um, I'll actually take that question. So all of our sequences are 3D sequences. Uh, all the slices are contiguous, no slice, gap, slice gaps. We acquired 3D because it's, it has beneficial properties for signal to noise ratio and is also uh, uh, more amenable to our uh, permanent magnet and its properties. Uh, the slice thickness for the T1, T2, and flare is five millimeters thick and for the diffusion weighted scan uh, is six millimeters. The in-plane resolution of the T1 and T2 are 1.5 by 1.5, and 
in plane, and for the flare, 1.6 by 1.6 in plane, and the diffusion is uh, 2.4 by 2.4. You can push the resolution a little bit higher, but you would have to uh, scan for longer. Okay, and the next question, what is the field strength? Not sure if I missed you mentioning it. Uh, do you have any other coils that can be purchased? The field strength is 64 millitesla, that's 0 0.064 tesla. Um, and at this moment, uh, the FDA cleared product has a head, has a head coil uh, that comes with that system. There are other works in progress, uh, anatomies and coils that are not yet cleared, but you can see some of those uh, example images on the website. So let me uh, go back over to uh, the interface. Hopefully it's coming through. Yes, it is. Okay, so that's the green bar. And if we look at the scan page, now we see a much more uniform a set of images on this montage view. And I'm going to show you the single uh, view image at a time. Uh, scroll up to the top of the brain and then scroll down slowly from the top to bottom. And like I was saying, uh, these are contiguous slices in 3D, a stack of 36 slices. So we can see the left and right ventricle coming in, the salt side gyri, now moving down into the deep brain, the orbits. You can see the optic nerves coming off the back of the orbits. Uh, our subject was very cooperative, sitting very still. The, the lenses of our eyes are there. Um, another thing to point out is uh, the sinuses are filled with air, and you normally have susceptibility artifacts uh, around the sinuses in high field. At low field, uh, we don't suffer from that problem. Same thing with the, um, the bones in the inner ear. And now we keep going down to the beginnings of the cervical spine. So we have full brain coverage all the way through the cerebellum and posterior brain. I don't see any more uh, questions, uh, but I want to hand it over to, uh, to Chris uh, to uh, wrap it up. Sure, for our audience, so should you have any questions, um, we're happy to remain here on, uh, on the line. Please use the Zoom functionality at the bottom of your screen window to enter uh, any questions. I will share a few questions from sort of our FAQ list, our frequently asked questions list. Uh, I'll, I'll, we'll talk about those for a moment. So Brian, can you tell us a little bit about the maintenance requirements? We all associate uh, advanced imaging equipment with a uh, service component or preventive maintenance. What is it like to live with Swoop on a daily basis in terms of maintenance and service? Sure, the system is designed to be low maintenance uh, and especially compared to a high flow conventional scanner, uh, we don't have uh, as much High voltage or high currents passing through our electronics. So our electronics have much longer lifespans. Uh, but when they do have any type of issue, everything's designed to be modular. So it's a very quick process to replace one of the electronic components, a gradient amplifier or power supply. And that can be done uh, very quickly. Those parts can be shipped through uh, regular parcel services like uh, GPS, FedEx, and DHL. So no problem there. And for uh, regular maintenance, uh, we're just asking our sites to scan monthly with a weekly, I'm sorry, a monthly uh, QA phantom and uh, one year plan maintenance uh, visits every 12 months. Thank you. And across the different use cases, I'm sure there are many minds like mine that are race a little bit about the potential applications of different departments, uh, different uh, disease states. Um, give us a sense of the popularity. Where is the most interest and demand coming from in the clinical community? And if you could uh, speak to that both for the U.S. market where we're clear and for the demand and interest being seen outside the United States. Sure. So in the U.S. market, our original use environment, use case, was the intensive care unit for those most fragile patients who really could not be moved from their rooms. Or as Chris described earlier, the process to do that, even when they can be moved, is, is so burdensome. It takes hours and hours. But since then, it's been recognized that there are other parts of the hospital, such as the emergency department, which uh, have uh, a great need for a device like ours. Uh, sometimes patients wait for hours uh, because they're you know, waiting for a break in the schedule. Uh, another great use environment uh, we're making an impact is the um, ED observation units where people with stroke-like symptoms can wait for eight, 12 hours uh, to be followed up with imaging. Uh, so it's really those times and places in the hospital where you would love to have an MRI at that moment uh, and you just have no ability to do it because of time access, because the schedule is filled up, um, or just taking them to that part of the hospital is a challenge. Uh, if we look beyond the borders of the U.S., there's a lot of interest in places that uh, would normally never 
dream of having access to MRI. It's just not a medical imaging modality that they have access to, um, but also clinics uh, that might be treating diseases such as cerebral malaria or hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy of newborns. Um, uh, also for monitoring of nutritional interventions and brain development, uh, it's finding applications in those, those areas of the world. Got it, thank you. Dr. Knopf, if I could turn to you and ask uh, among your peer community in neuroradiology and radiology, um, relatively uh, new to hyperfine and an official uh, status, what's been the reaction among your peers as awareness has grown and you know word of or sightings of the SOAP system have increased? Could you share some of the reactions from the clinical community? I think the clinical, the clinicians and the radiologists are just amazed at what's able to be done and seen, and they can answer these very specific questions without putting undue burden on the patient, the hospital staff, and their existing systems. You can envision that if you had to move an ICU patient down to a main hospital scanning system, you're gonna block that scanner off at least an hour or so just to do a routine non-contrast brain examination, not to mention all the resources that need to get pulled to do that and the potential risks occurring to that patient. Now that's all gone. You scan the patient in the ICU setting, you free up your main magnet and the clinical services that are using the system now are just reacting phenomenally to this. And every day they have the system, they find new use cases for the system. That's what we keep discovering. Clearly stroke, clearly acute neurologic emergency all in the ICU setting, the ER setting, the neurointerventional area, make treatment decisions, extend your therapeutic window for a TPA and the like. The use cases just keep growing the more and more people have this system and are starting to play with it. Some questions have come in to the Q&A and, and the three there, there are somewhat related. Uh, uh, first one is essentially, will there be musculoskeletal MRI capabilities and will that be with the current swoop design or will it be several devices? Um, and Rilea was asking about limb examination to extremities and coils and then finally can other parts of the body be imaged? Um, I'll say a few words and I welcome uh, Dr. Knopf or Chris to add. So we are pursuing other anatomies, uh, everything from foot ankle to knee uh, to cervical uh, uh, spine and neck. Those do require other coils, uh, but the system is designed to uh, have different coils attached to it. Uh, it's just at this time, only the head coil is available as a product. So um, in the coming uh, months, uh, Hyperfine will be pursuing these other anatomies. We like to say if it fits, it scans uh, here in the lab. So we've, we've fit a lot of different body parts uh, in there, even done a shoulder with, to a, with a very flexible person. Um, I don't know if uh, Dr. Knopf wants to add anything about the other anatomies that may be coming down the pipeline. I think something that would be obvious right off the bat would be cervical spine imaging. You know, in the setting of an acute, unstable, kind of traumatic patient, you just put them into the magnet and have a flex coil wrapped around it from a neuro standpoint. That would be the first bet, I would say, along with obviously the brain imaging that we're able to do right now. There was also a question in the chat window about how we try to use the system in non-urgent outpatient clinics, uh, lumbar and knee MRIs. Uh, lumbar spine has not been accessible to us yet. That's a little bit too low uh, in the spine, but we have uh, an example of a knee MRI on the website as a works in progress. As far as uh, non-urgent outpatient uh, applications in the brain, uh, we have our scanner sighted at some private practice neurologist office, offices and outpatient clinics uh, for uh, follow-up and hydrocephalus. So definitely there are other use environments that are not emergency environments that benefit from having this kind of um, accessible MRI. I'll share an interesting story about that. Brian, Please, that, that's like the perfect scenario. You know, the child with a known ventricular catheter all of a sudden gets a headache. Is it a headache like we all get? Or are they having shunt failure? What's the knee-jerk reaction? That child gets a CT. Over the course of their life, the amount of potential radiation they're receiving is phenomenal with added risk of a secondary neoplasm. You put this in the neurosurgery clinic, neurosurgeon's office, he looks, gets the ventricular size, he knows what the changes are, and it's over and done with. Parents are right with the child at the same time, saving the need for the CT. To the question about uh, outpatient uh, usage uh, in neurology, I'll, I'll share uh, really re a remarkable quick story is that, you know, we, we all know patients who experience real anxiety around MR between the noise and the claustrophobia and the whole experience. And so some people are, are they can't tolerate. Uh, 
Um, so the idea that in, in private practice that you could, you know, dedicate a room or this device looks nothing like the, you know, the, the mental expectation of what an MRI machine looks like or is rumored to look like for some, um, the idea that a physician could present to that patient and say, hey, look, I understand you're having some dizziness or some symptoms. Come with me. Let's go down the hall and let's, let's see what's going on. The patient walks into the room, sees a device and sees a scene much like this. Doesn't fit. They don't know. We haven't used the word MRI yet and is able to get a scan right there in that, in that very moment of care uh, without generating those feelings of anxiety. And, and that is, of course, great medicine. There's no sedation required. There's, there's no extreme you know, patient experience. Um, it's, again, it's a, it's a new moment for MR imaging. Um, I'll handle one last question. I'll check uh, while I'm speaking. We'll check before we, we sign out. But the question we often get is uh, you know, pricing. What does what this cost? We've talked about service. We've talked about a few things. But on our website today at hyperfine.io, you will find our pricing. You'll find what's included in that pricing. I'll just outline it with you here today. So I hope after having seen our demo today, you would agree that we have simplified MR, the equipment, MR, the experience. We also thought that it would be patently ridiculous to have a complicated pricing structure or some other way to, to buy a device like this. So you'll find it online. It's, it's there, very transparent. What it will tell you is this. For somewhere between five to 7,000 US dollars a month, Hyperfine Swoop, all software, all service, all connectivity, our cloud packs, all training, it's all included. Um, we don't believe in nickels and dimes and other things and added charges. We keep it really simple. It's part of our mission. I mentioned our twofold mission to go bedside and to make it economically accessible. So Hyperfine under Dr. Jonathan Rothberg's leadership really is a mission in the form of a company and you see that most of all in our pricing. So it's on there online, please check it out. We'll do one last sweep for any remaining questions. We invite ongoing inquiry and dialogue and you can reach us via our website. We have a, a toll free US number if you care to use that as well. Brian, any further questions? Yeah, I'll work in one last one. Uh, someone asked, is the scanner safe with implants? Uh, Dr. Knopf, do you wanna take that one? Sure, so obviously any sort of active implant device that's gonna be in the scanning field would have to meet MR compatibility requirements based on just FDA guidelines. In all honesty, there's probably no effect. That being said, active devices such as baclofen pumps, spinal cord stimulators and the like, well outside of the fab gas line are no problem whatsoever. In addition, any static device, so shunt, catheter valve mechanisms, aneurysm clips, because the field strength is so low, the susceptibility is so minimal, the artifacts from those types of devices are minimal to almost non-existent. So uh, good to go. Great. Thank you, Dr. Knopf. Uh, thanks to all of our, our friends and visitors and fans. We appreciate your time with us today. Please keep the dialogue going. Uh, reach us uh, on our website or our 866 toll-free number. We'll send out a quick thank you and a recording of this video to you within the next 24 hours. Thank you so much.